Yo, yo, yo. What it do, fam? What's going on, peoples? Happy Tuesday, man. You guys ready to get into some video gaming news? And then some more Dragon's Dogma 2? I am. Man, we ran across Dragon's Dogma 2 got kind of nuts yesterday. What's funny is like the day before, I was like, you know what's weird? Like, we haven't come across very many, like, quests in the game. <laughs> and then I... I feel like I kind of jinxed myself because, because, dude, um, yesterday we didn't like hardly fight anything except for getting caught in ox cart battles because we were just running across quest after quest after quest, man. It was crazy, but, uh, it's cool, man. It's nice. It was yesterday was a nice day, um, in, in opposition to what we've normally dealt with which is like maybe just a, a, a quest here and there and a lot of just discovering map which i mean the world creation you know the the development of that world is is phenomenal it's that world development is so good and for an open world game um Jesus, uh, I haven't I haven't played very many other open world games that have been developed as well as as Dragon's Dogma 2 has been, and it makes uh, the the world exploration feel just phenomenal. The only thing I feel like it is lacking is being able to get into the water. I, I wish that they wouldn't have done the same thing in this one they did in the previous games and gone, oh well, the water is lava. And I'll stick by that, dude. I know that other people will go, well, that's the way the other games were, and you know, it's part of the lore or whatever. But still, for a game that the the exploration, the world exploration is so good, um, it it feels like at this point they should have just opened up the water to be explored too. I mean, the the world is so well built, man. Give us that that in the water as well, you know? Like, just give us the water also. It feels a little bit lazy nowadays, in my opinion. But other than that, dude, the, the world is just excellent. And it's uh, it's so good to, to explore and flesh out and find things. And it's, uh, it's really, really neat. So we'll keep doing more of it today. Obviously, today will be day 15, I think it is. Should be day 15, yeah. And um, we'll get to that as soon as we finish up video gaming news this morning. So, obviously, we can't get started on playing video games until we talk about what's happening in the industry. So, let's go do what we do, baby. Let's get into video gaming news for today, April 9th. Let's go. We vibing, we vibing. No, oh, Jesus. Well, right out the gate, I mean, I yeah, I think that, you know, Disney Games hires former Blizzard executive Ray Gresco to work with Epic. I don't know very, you know, I don't really know anything about Ray, uh, to be honest with you. But what I can tell you is that a lot of the... Um, Uh, let's say past roughly 15 years for me of Blizzard has been really, really subpar. And um, I'm not a big fan of what Disney has been doing with their games already. And now they want to bring in an... an um, former executive of Blizzard, who I'm sure played a part in the past, you know, some part in the past 15 years of what was going on there. I don't know how long they haven't been a part of Blizzard now. So, I mean, you know, is that going to help them in my eyes? Probably not. You know, we could dive into that and start trying to pull up dates of when Ray worked there and stuff and, and what he was a part of, but it's not really worth to me, honestly. $70 games will go the way of the Dodo, believes Saber CEO. Yo, what's up, 8 Give it to me, my friend. Happy Tuesday, buddy. How you doing, man? Yeah, drop it. Drop it on me. Give me that knowledge, brother. 
Um, yo, this is kind of a wild article. $70 games will go the way of the Dodo, believe Saber. You see, yo, look, here's the thing. I've been saying ever since games started rising to $70 price tag, it was never needed in the first place. Are games becoming more expensive to create? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the difference, you know, being here that, um, just because a game is putting, or a development studio is putting more money into the budget doesn't mean the game's going to be good either. There's a recipe for success and there's a recipe for disaster. A lot of these bigger studios that have the money to dump into these big AAA budgets, some of them still understand what it means to create quality content. Many of them don't. So, um... It's not just, you know, well, games cost more to make, so we need more money to make you better games. That's not a, a uh, viable, you know, calculation there for us as, as the consumer and gaming enthusiasts that purchase these products, right? Um, the other thing is, I was pretty adamantly against this rise in price the whole time because... Where people were going, you know, well, we hadn't seen a rise in price in the past 20 years. And, you know, it's okay. And it, Dude, we were getting railroaded by prices in games in many, many other ways. Most of the time, you know, microtransactions, DLC that was obviously ready when the games were released. And then the DLC will come out a month and a half later and cost half the price of a, a full price game and stuff. You know, they were getting their money. They knew they were they were they found their ways to get their money out of us without having to raise the off the shelf retail price tag. But this is kind of cool to see this this sentiment come out from Saber now. What we have to figure out is is Saber, you know, sentiment going to be that $70 price tag will go away and the games will get cheaper again or go back to their their $60 triple A price tag or is the $70 price tag going to be extinct and it's going to go higher? You know, this can be taken one of two ways here, right? Let's hope it's the latter rather than the, uh, you know, or the former rather than the latter. But we'll, we'll dive into this and find out. It doesn't work, says 8-Row. Got a new skin recently and if the skin is like a knife or something... A lot of bots invite you to scam you. <laughs> no way, bro. Knife is invisible. I'm still getting invites. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah. They found some way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they circumvented the process. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the whole... That's that's the issue that we deal with nowadays in, in gaming as a whole, right? Um, It's... It's uh, it was probably initially an issue for a lot of these scammers and bots and and things like that, but they found a way. They found a way, and now now what Valve has to do is find find out how they did that. Right? How did they find a way to still see these items and try and prevent that? And then those scammers will find a way around that. You know, it's that cat and mouse game. It's the same thing as like um, hacking. In games, which we're about to talk about, Activision just banned 27,000 Call of Duty accounts last weekend. Let's talk about this. You know, and I'm guessing most of these 27,000 accounts will be for hackers and cheaters and stuff, right? Um, but it's the same cat and mouse game that gets played with developers and uh, hackers and cheaters and stuff all the time, too, right? I mean, they, they find ways around the, the, the anti cheat and. They find ways to, to implement cheats that aren't detected. And, and then the, the developer goes, okay, well, let's figure out how they did this and let's put up some safeguards to, to protect from allowing that to happen moving forward as well as let's get rid of those accounts. And then those cheaters and hackers find ways around that. It's always, it's always a back and forth battle, right? You know, so it, it doesn't surprise me. But I appreciate that update, dude. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. That's really interesting. I wonder, I wonder, you know, how they figured out what they implemented to, to still be able to see the invisible items and stuff. There's probably some kind of log. That's what I would assume. They, they probably, uh, may, maybe they still can't see the item necessarily, but they're, they, they've been able to uh, develop some kind of logging system or something like that. 
for the items and, and the names attached to them for, or the accounts attached to them or something like that. You know what I mean? It could be something along those lines, but again, I'm not familiar with that ecosystem. Um, anything like that, but who knows? Who knows, man? That's wild. There was an update for Dragon's Dogma 2, by the way. But it's not anything substantial. So it, I woke up this morning. I had an update for Dragon's Dogma 2. Um, it, here it is. What we got as of April 9th, which is today, we have released an update including the following modifications and fixes. Fixed issues that prevented progression in some quests. Fixed some terrain that caused characters to get stuck. And miscellaneous bug fixes. That's it. We're still waiting for the big performance improvements, man. Still. Still. <sighs> Unfortunately. We'll take a quick look and see what the Forza Motorsport 7th uh, update brings to the game. People haven't been liking this game that much from what I've seen. Review-wise, anyways. Yeah, this is actually really good stuff. We touched on this a few days ago. Um, there's a big um, movement right now uh, through the community of gamers to... Um, push for actual legal action against developers and publishers of video games to especially in the digital you know age of ownership to give us what we deserve to have on a lot of fronts you know and and we've talked about it but um let's see if they bullet point this a little bit let's see if they bullet point it and i'll talk about it and i'll, I'll link it to you guys too yo 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 um Hello. What's up, Davey? How you feeling, buddy? How's everything with the mouth, dude? Is it so far so good? I hope, man. You got like part of the day off today too, dude? You should just take the whole day, you know? Just hang out with us, brother. <laughs> oh, now pizza face too. Uh, I like the pizza face because it really like... It, it like magnifies my eyes and my mouth so I can do weird stuff with my tongue and make everybody enjoy that, you know? <laughs> and by enjoy disgust is what I mean. Oh, you go back to the dentist at nine. Got you, dude. Got you, got you. Just have to wait. Got Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I know you like pizza face, eight row. Yeah, it's funny. I'm glad you enjoy it. Yeah, everybody's kind of got their jam around here. You know what I mean? Everybody's got like their favorite kind of face filter. Everybody's got like their favorite uh, gift to play and sound effects and stuff. I like that, dude. I like that there's enough variety in, in the things that we have set up for the, the channel. That people have like these, um, these different redemptions that they're partial to. You know, it's really neat. I enjoy it. It's cool. Which was, you know, the point in me doing all this. Um... Yeah, political I action. Balls too, though. That's right. I love balls. <laughs> that was actually made by our friend uh, Gabs. I haven't seen Gabs in a little bit. She's been dealing with some life stuff, so I hope everything is good with Gabs. But uh, Gabs made yo yo yo. She made balls, and she made um, what's the the evil one? The evil one. Um, what did I call it? Suspect wanted. Evil antics, yeah. She made all three of those, dude. She made all three of those, which was incredible. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this is, um, again, we've covered this before, but I, I think that this is a very, very important um, movement that we should all be getting behind right now. And um, just so everybody knows, I... I took a deep dive into this the other day but i'm going to keep bringing it up as it, it remains a a very prominent thing in, in the video gaming news segments that we come across and and we need to continue to push to support this i truly believe that 
So what the Stop Killing Games end goal is that governments across the world will implement legislation to ensure the following, okay? These are the main things they're pushing for. Games sold must be left in a functional state. They can't, the, the games they sell that we buy cannot just be taken down that we, so that we can't access them anymore. Games sold must require no further connection to the publisher or affiliated parties to function, right? Talking about all that DRM crap that we deal with all the time. The above also applies to games that have sold microtransactions to customers, and the above cannot be superseded by end-user license agreements. There's a lot of good stuff happening here, and we really need to support this. Again, I'm going to leave it in the articles. I won't cover it in depth today because I've covered it in depth prior, but I highly recommend people take a look at this video. Um, really take, take a hard look at what's going on here and how you can help support this because... It is a very, very, very good thing um, for us to be doing and supporting and getting behind because it affects all of us as, you know, video gaming consumers and, you know, for all of us that love this form of entertainment in this world that, you know, we're always diving into all the time and especially as we move forward into continuing to move forward and it's not like we haven't already been, you know, pretty deep into the the you know, conversion of the digital realm of ownership in, in um, video games. But as we continue to get further and further into that, this means more and more and more for us, okay? So it's very important. Video game scams on the rise. I, I mean, technology as a whole, there's always just been a ton of scams. Dude, I remember getting scammed in, in you know, I, I, had to, I learned real early in, in video games that scammers were, were a thing. I'm talking like the, the Diablo 1 days, man. Getting scammed in Diablo 1 and it felt terrible. Scammers are smart though. They find really smart ways of, of making things seem legit. It's it's a really really brutal man. You feel so violated when it happens, you know. For the, all the legit gamers out there, um, it's really really brutal to deal with. Uh, I mean, scammers are, are just the same as hackers and cheaters, and you know they ruin uh, the experience for all the legit gamers out there. They suck. They're terrible. They should. You know, absolutely get wrecked. It sucks dealing with them, but you've gotta, you've gotta be on high alert all the time to, you know, protect yourself. That's all there is to it. Arabin Shadow Legacy it revives the style of single player game I sorely miss. Let's take a look at what this is. I don't know that I've seen this. Oh, are you? Yeah, no, that doesn't surprise me. You know. Just about any any competitive online multiplayer game you get in, you're going to deal with cheaters from time to time at least. You know, as much as the developer might like to promote themselves as, we use anti-cheat and, you know, we don't have cheaters in our game or whatever. They're, they're all, they always find a way, you know. Yeah. They always find a way, dude. Yeah, it's a cat and mouse game. And it sucks. They, dude, I hate cheaters. I'm, I'm so adamantly against it. Look, if you, again, my, my stance is like, if you want to play a single player game and you want to go, you know, cheat in it or whatever, you're not affecting anybody else. Then if that's how you want to have fun in it or whatever, that's not my way. But if that's your way, then whatever, have fun. You know, single player, you know, cheats and, and codes and stuff like that to give you an advantage in a game have been in single player games forever, right? And so... 
Um, if anybody wants to do that in their own experience and not, it, it doesn't affect anybody else's gameplay, then, you know, whatever, by all means, you do you. I don't really care. But whenever you start affecting other people's experiences, that's when I have a huge issue with it, you know? <laughs> and CS2, you play against legit players from time to time. That's terrible. That sucks, dude. That's a terrible thing to hear. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an advocate for just obliterating all cheaters. You know, like it, I, I, I want a world where anybody that gets uh, caught cheating, hacking, ruining the experience for all the legit players gets completely removed from the game. Can't ever play the game again. Um, you know, I mean, ban them from the entire, you know, can't can't play that developers games for the next 10 years i don't care dude um it, it's you know of course the developers don't want to do that because that means they don't make as much money right but i'm of that notion i'm like just wreck wreck them to the the flipping greatest extent throw the book at them dude i it's so gross it's so gross um and they uh you know it's a bunch of yeah, I know, I know, dude. I mean, but that's 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 where I would I would like it to be. I know, that's why I just said what I said, you know. But um, it's uh, sometimes we get these these implementations that you know it seems like developers are trying to find better ways to deal with these people, you know, prevent them from making dupe accounts and stuff like that. Um, and I think there there's sometimes it gives me. Uh, a smidgen of hope for a better world for all of us legit gamers but i i mean i'll i've said it before and i'll say it again people that hack and cheat in in competitive multiplayer games are just soft ass gamers they're soft ass gamers they they want instant satisfaction and gratification for not having to learn how to get good at playing a game they can't stand to lose and um, so instead, what they do is they, they cheat to get the upper hand. And um, it's gross, man. It's disgusting. And one of my favorite things to watch on YouTube, man, is to just watch videos of like streamers and content creators and stuff that want to act like they're good at games um, getting caught cheating. I love it, dude. I love watching them get caught cheating. You know, and try to and try to like scapegoat it and point fingers as to why you know they weren't really doing what they were doing when it was quite obvious. You know, I love that stuff. Mm. Yeah, yeah. There's always been issues too of of like legit accounts uh unfortunately getting caught in mass bans and stuff like that for weird reasons and and uh you know it's one of those things that developers it's, it's a really it's a tough situation for developers as a whole you know i've i've really enjoyed seeing some of the more creative ways that developers and i'll even you know you know me i'm not a big activision fan um for what they've become uh, over the you know probably past 10 to 15 years either but um, Activision uh, recently came out with a, a pretty cool way to deal with the cheaters in their game, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, which was called, they, they were splatting people. And um, originally, people didn't know what was going on, right? So this, this whole splat issue in Call of Duty was Activision's way of dealing with cheaters without banning their account these cheaters accounts that were getting caught for 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 cheating or hacking or whatever anytime they would drop in to a map they their parachute would pop at first and then all of a sudden their parachute would just go away and they would just fall all the way to the ground and they couldn't pull their parachute back out right so they're like what's going on you know they thought it was a bug and they'd fall all the way down and they'd hit the ground <laughs> and they'd die and then, like, if they had a teammate or whatever, the teammate would come res them. And as soon as they stood up, they'd take, like, two or three steps and they'd fall back down and die again. <laughs> and so, what's funny, the, the best part about it was that, and I watched some videos of it happening. The best part about it was that they thought it was a bug, right? They thought it was a bug. So, they started trying to, like, call out Activision on social media. 
saying like, yo, fix your game, da da da, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm dying every time I try to, and then Activision replies with, you're dying every time because you got splatted because you're a cheater. So not only is was that like a cool way of Activision taking care of cheaters' accounts and making them just die over and over and over and over again anytime they wanted to play, but it also resulted in a lot of these cheaters basically calling themselves out on social media. So for anybody that didn't know they were a cheater in the first place, they were trying to, uh, you know what I mean? These these cheaters were trying to point a finger at Activision and go, yo, why did you do, you know what I mean? Fix your game. Da, da. And Activision's like, the game's fine. You're a cheater, and that's why you're dying all the time. So they basically had all these cheaters calling themselves out. It was hilarious, dude. I loved it. I like the the very unique ways in which some of these developers have, have found to, to call cheaters out. And, and um... Because a lot of these developers know that it's not good for their game. It's not good for their game. It's not good for the communities that, that play their games. You know, it's very detrimental. It hurts their, their games uh, quite often when people are, are cheating and hacking in their, their software. And I love seeing the unique, very um, inventive ways that developers come up with to, to deal with cheaters. And that, that splat one was just phenomenal, dude. I was dying whenever I saw it. It was so good. Ooh. Xbox getting slammed over controversial post about graphics in video games. League of Legends is getting a vampire survivors like PVE mode. Interesting. Dude, the weather finally turned around for us yesterday. Dude, it was like nice. It was really nice for like two weeks. And all of a sudden that like cold front that came over North America just like crushed us for like a week and a half. Dude, we like it started snowing again. It was crazy, dude. But yesterday it actually got up into like uh, the low 70s, man. And it was the perfect day for it too. Because we, we just got to like sit outside and like watch the eclipse. You know what I mean? It was a really nice afternoon, really nice evening. Uh, felt really good, dude. I'm so glad the weather's turning back over. <laughs> yeah, look at this. Disney Games appoints Blizzard and Ubisoft veterans to its leadership team. Personally, I mean, that doesn't make them look very good in my eyes. One second. Sorry, guys. I mean, look, I mean, here's the thing. Do I think that all of the leadership that's ever been a part of Blizzard and Ubi is, is bad? No. I think there's quite possibly some of the leadership that uh, has been part of Blizzard and Ubi that has left because they didn't want to be a part of the, the bad things that were happening there. Quite possibly. Maybe that's some of what's coming over to Disney. Could be. But I think there's been a lot of really bad leadership that has pervaded both of these companies for a very long time. So the chances of, you know, bad leadership being a part of Disney coming over from these companies is probably greater than the chance of good leadership coming over and being a part of Disney. I, that's just, I think... That's just math, <laughs> you know, but what I don't know for sure. It's just seeing both these names and leadership going to a, a, another company that's diving headfirst into gaming right now makes me go, oh, 
Yeah, probably not great. It's, it's happening, huh? Yeah, the Wii U's online services have gone off. off. They're, they're... So what I'll say is there is this link. I'll just give us there. We knew that was happening. I forgot that that date was upon us, though. Um, the Pretendo network is being set up. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Give me this. We can always hope, 8-Row. We can always hope that they do a, a better job than they have of preventing the cheaters in your game. You know what I'm saying? Um, this is the Pretendo Network. They're doing everything they can to get services back up for the 3DS and the Wii U. Um, as a kind of just a, a community-based implementation for uh, picking up the ball where Nintendo is dropping it. Right? Um, I mean, I think this is... Again, a lot of this comes back to what we talked about uh, earlier with this preserving uh, old video games and Nintendo's terrible about it. But the Pretendo network is something that hopefully will come to fruition and giving us what Nintendo is always uh, taking away and specifically been taking away as of recent with the 3DS and the Wii U. You can read all this right here. It'll give you the breakdown. Looks like uh, Xbox is catching up a little bit to the PAL World updates on PC right now, which is good. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> uh... Scope one head does not register. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Dude, that always feels bad. Yeah, yep. What frame rate are you playing at, eight row? What FPS do you play at? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Yo, the Triple I initiative is happening tomorrow. So we got this up. <clears throat> um, we'll talk about this. I uh I was originally We'll talk about this. I I'm going to see if I can go live for just about 45 minutes and watch this, okay? Great question. You don't know what frames you're playing at, dude? Oh, 144? Okay, yeah. Nice. Yeah, it's usually what I try to play most of my FPS. Uh, you know, most of my shooter games as a whole. It could be, FP, uh, you know, FPS games, third-person shooter games. Try to play it like 120 to 144, you know? <clears throat> yeah. Right on. Yeah, especially at that kind of frame rate, dude. Feels bad. Feels bad when you, you've got a... a straight up scoped out headshot and and it doesn't register that that's not a good feeling dude it's not a good feeling if it was a low frame rate then there might be some kind of issue of you know well maybe it was a little bit laggy or something but that a higher frame rate kind of takes away some of that notion of it potentially that being an issue yeah Uh, 
Oh, for real? Oh, that's not good, dude. Wow. What's your what's your ping at? What kind of ping are you playing at, dude? Well, that shouldn't be an issue then. Mm, yeah, that doesn't feel good. Could just be cheaters, dude. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know what kind of cheats people run in those games, but... I would assume most of the time they run offensive cheats. You know what I mean? Aimbot, uh, stuff like that. Uh, seeing through walls, you know, tagging tagging all your enemies through walls and stuff like that. Um, there's all kinds of different cheats, but you know, maybe maybe there's some cheats that are preventing uh, people from taking headshots and stuff too. Yeah, Boulder, uh, you know, Larian has did a great job with their early access on Boulder's Gate 3, and and um, they're basically saying that they're planning on doing that with their next game as well, but that it's not for every dev. The thing is, I think it can be very beneficial if devs understand how to implement it correctly, you know. But it's a, it's a, it can be a very uh, tumultuous kind of, um system to implement and utilize uh, to your advantage you you got to understand that you're going to be having to sift through tons of data tons of feedback and you're not going to be taking all of it to heart you've got to find out the you know the higher points of data where people are coming to the same kind of conclusion about the things that they want to see in the game that's probably where you're going to be getting most of your data from that you want to look hard at implementing for your title you know whereas you're also going to have to deal with just people being assholes about feedback and stuff like that you know it's not a great thing that i, I would say it's not as much a, a thing of uh it's not for every dev I'd say it's more about not every dev is built to deal with it. You know what I mean? That's why it's not for every dev. The devs that can implement it and deal with it very well, their games usually end up coming out much better for us as game players. But it's not a great process for developers as a whole, I don't think, to deal with uh, while they're in the process of utilizing it. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. It sounds like it, eight row, yeah. It sounds like it. The <laughs> dog. This unopened Castlevania NES. NES version of Castlevania sold for over $90,000, bro. Holy crap. Jesus. Yo, you guys remember when we covered, what was it, like, at the end of 2022, I think. We covered that, like, Pokemon uh, Yellow. It was a Pokemon Yellow, I think. Un unopened Pokemon Yellow. It was graded an A-. minus. It was in like a hard shell and everything, and it was being brought from some other country into the U.S., and one of the customs agents popped it open and used a box cutter on the front of the flipping box, dude. I was livid. It wasn't even mine. I was so pissed. Xbox adds two more great games today. We'll see what these are.
Yeah, I'll say, dude, I've been talking about this. The uh, the Dragon's Dogma 2 um, banter uh, between the um, the pawns and yourself and the, you know, it, it gets really old. It's very repetitive. I mean, yeah, uh, you can send it through Discord. I'll take a look at it. You know what I mean? For sure. I mean, probably not right now, but, you know, I'm interested to see what you're talking about, for sure. You can play Sea of Thieves solo. It's going to be a better experience playing it multiplayer. It will. But if you learn how to play that game solo and get really good at it, it'll make playing it multiplayer even that much easier for you. I've seen people play Sea of Thieves solo and just crush and do really good, even against ships, f like like a crew, like against a crew, you know what I mean? If you know what you're doing, then you can be good even solo, but it's obviously going to be uh, an easier process with a crew that knows what they're doing. A lot of Sea of Thieves stuff coming out right now because it's going to be dropping on PS5 pretty soon. New April PS5 release will be free with PS uh, PS Plus at launch. We'll see what this is. Nope. 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 Meh. Meh. I'll be honest. I don't really care about this Hellblade 2. Uh, so Ninja Theory apparently is having some kind of live stream event happening for Hellblade 2 this week. I don't really care. I'll be honest with you. As somebody who was really, really hyped about this game in the first place for some of the um, initial things rolling out they were showing about this game, as we've gotten closer and closer and gotten more and more about what this game, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to air quote that game, is, um, I am just really not interested in this title at all. We're talking about a game being released at a $50 price point for the base edition. It's uh, a total of eight hours long. It's, um, in my opinion, not going to be a true video game. It's going to be more of a cinematic, visual, interactive experience. So it, it's uh, going to be more like um, a movie or a show that you have a little bit of interactability with. And so they're, they're trying to call it a video game. And... Um, Will it potentially be visually striking? Yeah, but it's weird to me that, like, why do they want to make this as a video game? Why do they want to call it a video game when really it feels like what they should have done is just made a TV show out of it? They should have made, like, an eight-episode TV show um, because that's really what it feels like they wanted to do with this. Uh, the more we found out about this, the more the, the less interested I am, you know? Two to three hundred million project. Eight hours is fifty dollars worth eight hours of your game time. You know, I think that's what people need to be asking themselves right here. Is is fifty dollars worth, you know, only eight hours? It doesn't seem like this is gonna have a lot of replayability in it or anything like that. Now it will be on Game Pass. So that there's something right there. It'll be on Game Pass day one. So if you're a Game Pass subscriber, then it 
quite possibly is going to be worth taking a look at. I think that, you know, as far as like potentially narrative and and visually and stuff, it'll probably be pretty decent. But as far as a true video game, I'm just not feeling it. Um, so, I don't know. I think everybody needs to understand like what this is actually going to be. What if you're if you're planning on buying this outright, what you're actually getting out of this in comparison to what you could get for fifty dollars in some other games, even less, you know? Um Oh yeah, A Road really. Yeah, yeah. I mean it's I think that uh, Sea of Thieves is definitely a game built for multiplayer for sure. Yeah. But it can be done solo. It can be done. I've seen I've seen people play Sea of Thieves solo and do very, very well at it. But it's 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 you're talking, you got to be an under understand you have to be a very good multitasker, you know, you got to be a very good multitasker to, uh, and you got to have good base knowledge about the game all the way around. Well, yeah, yeah, but I mean, um, so they did that, which actually does make playing solo much easier. But if you want to play solo in the main servers that were built for the game you can still do that it's not going to be real easy but you can still get it done as long as you have a base pretty solid foundation knowledge of the game and you're pretty good at multitasking it's going to be a struggle though you know that's more what i was talking about but you're right they did yeah it's, it's a good point dude i watched people play solo uh, before i ever started streaming before they ever made those solo servers, you know? I don't think there's going to be a lot of issue here. This is what, uh, there's a report. It's like, yo, PlayStation, uh, you know, gamers, if you want some of other Xbox's other first party games, you know, <clears throat> then you need to show that you're interested in Xbox's first party games that are coming to your platform, like Sea of Thieves. But right now, Sea of Thieves is the most pre-ordered game on PlayStation right now. Right now, right now? I said that too many times. But, um... I don't think there's going to be an issue. I really don't. Xbox is very adamant about getting their titles out onto competitors' platforms. And I do think that the more profitable, the more lucrative this initial venture into this for Xbox, the, the better it is for them. The more people are buying and playing these games, uh, the more reason they have to put bigger and better games on competitors platforms right so they're not wrong here but um there's already a ton of people pre-ordering sea of thieves on playstation's platform which is good for xbox wait what armor core 6 is 50 percent off right now Oh, dude, I'm not a big fan of CD keys. I'm not going to promote that. I think they've gotten better over the years, but dude, I remember back whenever CD keys uh, was kind of in its infancy and, and people were getting duped, duped like like bad keys and stuff. And, and ever since I've been kind of reluctant to ever be uh, have anything to do with their site. Okay, that's it. Let's go with this. These will be our articles for the day. Hey, Ro, uh, thanks for sending me that, dude. I'll watch it uh, a little bit later. Um, I'm, I am interested to see what you're talking about. You know, I've experienced the same thing sometimes in games. You know, 
And it wasn't a, a matter of like, you know, uh, I think I was on there. It was like, bro, that was a dead locked on headshot. And I play it like the same frames you do. And, and I, I usually play on servers that are like, <clears throat> you know, give me a pretty good ping and stuff. So um, when that happens, dude, it always feels bad. It's like, bro, where was that shot? Where did that shot go, dude? Like, that looked like a dead ringer headshot, dude. <laughs> like, give me a break. It always feels bad. Um, let's dive into this. Game Pass adds two more games today. Kona and Botany Manor today for console and PC, offering players interactive adventuring and relaxing plant field puzzling fun. They've got some trailers for it. Bro uh, Botany Manor is a brand new puzzle game from Balloon Studios launching on uh, Series X and S and Xbox One today. Um, step into the shoes of a 19th century botanist living in the titular Botany Manor who's attempting to finish her book, Forgotten Flora. First person game tasking you with exploring the manor, finding seeds, and working out the best habitat for your budding plants. It's on PC as well. And then Kona. Kona originally launched in 2017 on Xbox One, developed by Parable. First installment of a four-game series sees you playing as private detective Carl Fubert, or Faubert, Faubert, who is attempting to solve multiple vandalism cases in North, northern Canada, perpetrated against a rich industrialist while an unexpected snowstorm rolls through the area. Faubert becomes trapped but continues to investigate in the eerie area, nonetheless battling the elements and uncovering surreal events. Um, Kona is on Xbox Series X and S and One. Doesn't say PC though. So if you want to take a look at what these games are, I'll link this to you. You can watch the trailers, but these are the games that just hit Xbox uh, Game Pass. All right. New April PS5 release will be free with PS Plus at launch. A new release on PS5 this month will be free via PS Plus when it releases, or at least free via some tiers of PS Plus. If you are a PS Plus Essential subscriber, you will need to fork over the normal asking price just like every non-PS Plus subscriber on PS5. Those with either an active subscription to PS Plus Extra or Premium, though, they will be able to download the game for free when it releases on April 23rd. It is called Tales of Kinzuru Zao. We've looked at this. Um, it's a side-scrolling platformer from developer Surgeon Studios and publisher Electronic, uh, Electronic, uh, Electronic Arts. Um, if you are on PS5 when it releases, you can either fork over $20 to play it or subscribe to, to Extra or Premium. We've seen the trailer for this before, but I will link this to you as well if you want to see what this game's about, all right? Good old EA make you want to throw up. You know what I mean? Um, Arabin Shadow Legacy revives a style of single player game I sorely miss. Let's see what this is. Um, Arabin Shadow Legacy is a throwback to an era of single player video games that I miss. Um, earlier this year, I played 2008's Prince of Persia after getting into the series with the release of The Lost Crown. That title was ahead of its time in many ways, but I appreciated that it was an all-killer, no-filler style of single-player game. I enjoy when games simply center the experience around a core idea or two, then explore that thoroughly in a compact 6-8 to eight hour adventure that doesn't overstay its welcome. I was facing a bit of game burnout when, after playing through long titles like Dragon Infinite Wealth, uh, which nobody should have been buying since they uh, paywalled New Game Plus. Suicide Squad killed the Justice League, which always looked like it was going to be not fantastic, and it wasn't. Helldivers 2, which took the world by storm. Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, which was apparently phenomenal as well. And Dragon's Dogma 2, which we are playing currently and has been fantastic over the past couple of months, but Arab and Shadow Legacy provided some respite for that. Let's take a look at this. Look, all I want is to find my people. Then let's help each other. There are places we can only access with your specialist skills. Oh god, it started. The 
That's some pretty cool uh, mechanics going on. I like that. Find Interesting. Us. Nice. April 10th, huh? Steam. Cool, man. Uh, Arab and Shadow Legacy is a stealth game from a baby robot games that is centered around a character who can merge and travel through shadows. Throughout its eight-hour adventure, Arabin thoroughly explores that gameplay hook in a tightly designed creative sci-fi adventure that you can beat over the course of a night or two of playing. While the notion of wanting shorter games made by smaller teams is a bit of a cliche at this point, playing through Arabin Shadow Legacy reminded me of why that's become a popular refrain for some players in recent years. Um, you can read everything about the game below here. I'll link this to you if you're interested. They give you a pretty nice little synopsis. But uh, that looks kind of cool, man. Looks kind of cool. I like the, uh, the mechanics I'm seeing there. Some stealth gameplay, you know what I mean? Stealth gameplay is cool. Uh, I'll also pull this up on Steam for you guys. It does look like it's going to be on Epic as well, though. We'll watch it after it releases uh, tomorrow and see how it's doing. But uh, there you go. If you want to see this on Steam, it's linked there as well. <clears throat> cool, man. Xbox gets slammed over controversial post about graphics in video games. We covered an article yesterday. Um about Hellblade 2 and Ninja Theory saying um, they weren't providing Xbox players any graphical options at all. They uh, This game is just going to be a base 30, 30 frames per second and you get no graphical options. And I was like, what are you talking about, dude? This is Ninja Theory is a subsidiary of Xbox. They're liter literally owned by the platform and it's coming out with no graphical options? This is that thing, I'm going to go back to what I say all the time about developers. Developers, the best thing they can do is give the game player options. If you want to try and act like everybody only cares about visual fidelity, you're wrong. If you want to act like everybody only cares about higher frame rates over visual fidelity, you're also wrong. So the best thing you can do is give people options of how they would best rather play and experience their their games right but we see this happen all the time where these developers feel like well we're just going to give uh one option and you're just going to have to deal with it that sucks that's not the way this should be you want to act like everybody's of the same mindset we all have the same you know preference of of how we play our games no that's stupid you know what i mean what a boring world it would be if we, we all had the, the same exact, you know, notions about who we were and what we liked. And it would be easier for them, but it'd be a boring ass world. That's for sure. Um, so I think that's probably where this is coming from a little bit. And uh, I mean, I was even pretty vocally calling them out yesterday saying this seems pretty dumb. Um so let's see what happened here. The recent developments of Sunua Saga Hellblade 2 confirmed that it will run at 30 frames per second on Xbox Series X and S, news that didn't sit well with some users and fans of the brand. They believe that exclusive games within the ecosystem should fully utilize the hardware's power. Yep. As indicated by each console's respective boxes and promotional materials, the debate about gameplay graphics and respective, or excuse me, and respect for creative vision ignited on social media and Xbox fueled the fire with a controversial post. Um, Xbox ignites controversy with post. The ex official Xbox account on Twitter sparked controversy with a post stating that, quote, how a game plays is greater than how a game looks. I mean, I'm of that mindset too. Because look, this is... So, um... This is the... I, the reason I feel like that is, is because of this. If a game does not perform well, how can you appreciate what a game looks like? It doesn't matter how badass a game looks. If it performs terribly, if it plays poorly, you know what I mean? If it's stuttery, if it frame drops, if it, you know, it glitches out and, and, and bugs and, and stuff like that. You know what I mean? If, if 
if any of that kind of stuff and and etc 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 happens it doesn't matter how good the game looks because you're not going to be able to enjoy that content because it plays like crap so i respect the notion that there are so many people out there and i know this is a fact there's so many people out there that would prefer a game to look as good as possible and and they're fine with playing it at 30 frames i'm not that person you know what i mean i respect it but i'm not that person and especially like i just talked about when you're talking about which one should have a a, a priority i'm always going to side with performance because it's just a fact if a game performs poorly you can't enjoy the experience of what it looks like if you can't play the game that's a fact suggesting so so the official xbox account on twitter sparked controversy with a post stating that how quote how a game plays is greater than how a game looks suggesting that gameplay is better and more important than graphical fidelity and I, I wholly agree with that. While it's true that a game's essence lies in its design and mechanics as a creative work, gameplay-wise, it's also true that its visual aspects hold significant importance from a holistic perspective. Some responses to Xbox's post pointed out that it's not right for the brand to turn it into a decision for players. Uh, finding a balance is crucial, as highlighted by Mike Ibarra. Um... I wasn't a fan of Mike Ibarra, former Xbox executive and ex-head of Blizzard. He was only the head of Blizzard for a little bit after uh, Xbox bought Blizzard and then he was gone, which I was actually okay with. I, I wanted him to not be a part of Blizzard after Xbox and Microsoft bought them anyways. Additionally, journalist Tom Warren sarcastically remarked that 60 frames per second is better than 30 frames per second. While the Charlie Intel account specializing in Call of Duty mentioned that it, it would be best if both aspects were on par. Well, on the other hand, some Xbox users wrote to Xbox stating that this discourse may serve casual players, but not those who invest in powerful console like the Xbox Series X. From their perspective, the minimum uh, expectation should include two visual modes, one focusing on performance and frame rate and the other on graphics. I agree. I agree. I talked about this yesterday. Well, so, so what I said yesterday was, look, it feels ridiculous that as a first party game coming to their consoles this game is being um constrained to having no kind of options for the game players the best thing you can do as a developer is give game players options because again we're not all the same some people want a higher uh you know fidelity at a lower frame rate other people want, want, you know, they're okay with the game not looking as good, but having a smoother gameplay experience, meaning a higher frame rate, as myself, right? And the best thing you can do is understand the fact that the best thing you can do from a development standpoint is give everybody options so that they are able to play the game to their preference instead of constraining people to only being able to experience the game um, the way maybe other people like the game. That sucks. That's not the way to do things. And what I brought up yesterday was that, you know, I think that what part of this comes down to is that this game is above and beyond what they could probably get done on the Series S in many, many forms and fashions. The Series S is, I think, something that Microsoft has to be looking back on and going, we probably shouldn't have done that. They keep defending it. And of course, they're going to defend their decision to come out with two consoles. You know, the Series X, which is the much more powerful console, and the Series S, which probably shouldn't have ever been made. It not only has been constraining to any developer that wants to put out products and software games on Microsoft's platforms, because Microsoft has this, this kind of... Um, fine print that says if you want to release a game on xbox it has to be released on both platforms series s and series x and so for a lot of developers it's severely constraining because you basically have to make sure that the game your games can run first and foremost on a very very underpowered piece of hardware the series s and and it's very difficult for a lot of developers and also it's rough on their in-house first party studios i mean take a look right now again 
I, I definitely am of this notion. I'm always going to side with the gameplay being polished and smooth, a higher frame rate, no stutter. You know what I mean? That is always going to take precedence for me over anything uh, uh, like graphical fidelity. You know? Because it's a fact. You, if, if a game, if you're trying to play a game at the highest graphical fidelity, but it's going to cause issues with your gameplay experience because you're having stuttering and, and constant frame drops and, and all kinds of issues with the way the game plays, you can't enjoy what the game looks like because the game plays like balls. You know, that's just a fact. But everybody should be able to play a game at, at, at what their preference is. And options are critical. Developers have to understand that. You're catering to a wide range of audiences with a wide range of preferences. And the best thing you can do is cater to those preferences. And quit just constraining everything to being what you think people should want. That's not the way this works. You make products for a customer. For many customers, right? And all those customers have a different preference. Some are going to align on different aspects across the board of what they prefer. But you need to hit everything uh, as, as much as you can across that spectrum, right? And this is just... You know, many developers are, are failing in regards to this notion. And Xbox is failing right here. Ninja Theory is failing right here. I talked about it yesterday. No doubt about it, man. Where's Murdoch? League of Legends is getting a Vampire Survivors like PvE mode. Um, well, this is weird. Ah, League of Legends. A MOBA that occupied my university years while I'd argue climbing the ranked ladder with my housemates were some of the best gaming moments I've ever had. I'd also argue giving up League was necessary. I became too involved, too close to the toxicity. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's a toxic game. But now League's threatening to drag me back in with something I hadn't uh, seen coming. A Vampire Survivors like PvE mode. No, I must resist. Yo, it's random mode time. Get your random modes in there and we'll watch this. Oh man, Pepe W, bruh. And rule five, get your animotes in, try to get a free sub, guys. Let's watch this, let's see what they're saying here. Is Murdoch hanging up? Where's Murdoch? Murdoch's our, I think Murdoch might be here. Nice eight row, nice. Well played, sir. Murdoch's our, our resident lol aficionado. So, uh, 637, Jesus. I'll see if I can find the, uh, they're hey, talking folks, a I'm lot. Andre, they're, talking a lot. they're talking Jeremy, a lot. AKA they're talking Ryan a lot. They're talking a lot. And we're back with another dev update with the, re let's get here. Nice Davey. Survivor game mode and a future dev update. Thanks for playing. And we'll see you all in arena. In January, we shared that we're updating the champion mastery system. When we announced it, there was some feedback from you all regarding the changes. And one area of feedback was... I will link this whole thing so anybody that wants to watch the whole thing, they can't. them the next split. And we agree. So we've made the champion-specific titles permanent. We're also changing the way you gain mastery points. Currently, your mastery score is impacted by your team's Bro, they didn't show any of it. But with this update, it'll only account for your own performance instead of factoring in your team's overall average. We're also changing how much wins and losses are weighed. So even if you lose your game, you'll still progress your champion mastery more than you would today. We're targeting to launch the system with the changes we just mentioned on, on. patch 1410 on May 15th. Right. Okay, it's also been a bit since we Arena. talked about Lee Sin. Oh, they so talked about the PvE mode back, back here. Hold on. on. Is going. As one of our older and most iconic champions, Lee Sin needs Hold a... Let's, let's, let's do this. All right, so now on to something we touched upon. They're just not going to show game. anything, apparently. We told you all that we were cooking up another new game mode, and we wanted to tell you all a little bit more about it today. We mentioned that we were making something that would be a little different take on League's core gameplay, but a bit more chill comparing to Arena. Well, after months of work, it's time to let you all know that we are currently working on our first Bullet Heaven Survivor PvE game mode. 
In this mode, you'll be able to fight against hordes of enemies by yourself or with friends. So whether you're looking for a challenge or you just want to have some fun with friends, we want this to be something everyone can enjoy. I know a lot of us, myself included, have some pretty fond memories of previous PvE modes like Odyssey or Star Guardian, but this time we wanted to make something markedly different. And while we aren't quite ready to show you much yet, we can give you a little bit of an idea of what this looks the guy, like. Early the in guy development. looks kind of like oh, a lot like one of my um, coming out alongside our my wife's cousins, dude. He's year. a really good dude. Well, that's it for modes for now. But we hope you'll enjoy the return of Arena, and we'll be back to share more news about our upcoming Bullet Heaven Survivor game mode in a future dev update. Thanks for playing, and we'll okay. see you all so that's, in They're Arena. not showing us anything. That's it. In January, we shared that we're updating the Champion okay. Mastery system. Uh, interesting. Yeah, they call it a Bullet Heaven Survivor PvE game mode. Interesting. Which is a bit confusing. Uh, what makes it a heaven, as that's what they said here as well, makes it a heaven uh, as opposed to a hell? Is it uplifting, being swarmed by killer bullets, or just the fact that you don't have to deal with toxicity? <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, a uh, quote, you'll be able to fight against hordes of enemies by yourself or with friends. Yeah. This is a this is one of the uh the pictures of it. So you can see the vampire survivor esque kind of uh mode they're implementing there, yeah. Colossal mess of minions on the screen with Jinx at its center. League's enormous roster of champions and the universe they've built upon make for a very strong bullet heaven on paper. Each champion's base attack would be whatever they started off with. You'll earn experience from the minions to level and perhaps select items from a list every time you you ding. Uh, or level, right? I mean, envis uh, envisioning a mode that encourages and fast tracks you to fun experimental builds away from the stakes of traditional league game. We'll see what comes, man. That's interesting. I thought they were going to show more of it, but uh, they just kind of talked about it. So, unfortunate. I'm sure we'll see more moving forward. And, uh, you know, I'll link this here. Throw it in there. If anybody wants to watch all of that, I'll, I don't know if Murdoch's hanging out or not. So, I'll, uh, Let's do this. He probably already knows, but you know, I like to try and ping people with content that they they are more um, affiliated with, it, just in case. Um, <clears throat> here, let me. There you go. Cool. Um, now, uh, I actually uh, really am glad to see something like this. So um, before I even talk about the premise of what this article is is addressing, right? Uh, so for those of you that don't know Sabre, Sabre is the subsidiary of, well, the former or about to be former subsidiary of Embracer that is uh, being purchased by private investors. They are one of the few subsidiaries of Embracer that has found their way out from underneath the uh, incredibly disgusting, crushing machine that is Embracer. And as we've seen over the past year and a half to two years, Embracer has just been destroying everything underneath them, right? It's really, really gross. And... Um, Saber has been saved for the moment, anyways, by some private investors. They've also, if you weren't aware, the whole Knights of the Old Republic remake fiasco was originally something that was given to Aspire Studios, which is also another Embracer subsidiary, but they kind of botched it, right? Um, and then after the whole fiasco of Aspire not doing well with that project in the first place, it was handed over to Sabre. Well, with Sabre's sell to these private investors, Sabre has been given um, the rights to take the Knights of the Old Republic uh, licensing with them for making the remake and everything. But the weird situation here is that it will still also be labeled with Embracer even after it finishes. Even though the game won't finish under Embracer, it 
started with Embracer. It will still be attached to Embracer on release. So Embracer still stands to profit off of it when it comes to fruition. Saber is still working on it. We've been, you know, we've verified that. And they are the ones that have the rights to finish the production of the game um, and development of the game, you know. Now, um, with that prefacing, with that information for those that weren't aware, we, we now have this coming out from underneath Embracer, or, or not Embracer, but uh, Saber as well. So, $70 games will go the way of the Dodo, believes Saber's CEO. The former interim Embracer COO believes developers will move to reduce risk and cost. Um, as I said when I brought this article up, I... Uh, I was so, so turned off by the fact the industry was was heavily pivoting uh, towards games moving from $60 AAA price tags to $70 AAA price tags. And it was because it didn't make sense. You know, yeah, a lot of these, these games are becoming um, more expensive to make, but that's not a recipe for success, right? We know that. We've seen that. Um, just because a studio is large and they have a lot of resources to throw at a game, whether it be, you know, personnel, manpower, or money to throw at a game doesn't mean a game is going to be successful. There are so many big studios that have forgotten what it means to, uh, create games that, uh, are filled with fantastic content and they just try to find ways to, to kind of bring people in off of the premise of a universe that appeals to people and uh, fill it with, you know, this is the thing, microtransactions or battle passes or the DLC that comes out a month and a half after the game releases where you know that content was ready for the game, but they make you pay, you know, a quarter to half of what the game even cost off the shelf for the DLC that comes out, you know. There's all kinds of ways in which these developers and publishers have found to make you pay more, 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 more for the games you're already paying AAA price tags for. They they were already getting their $70 and more than that. They didn't need to raise the price tag, but they did it anyways. Yeah? I mean, you can look at games like recently, you know, Suicide Squad, Kill the Justice League. It was disgusting to see what they did. There was no need for that game to be a $70 price tag game with all the monetization in it and everything. And I mean, it, it, it was just gross, right? And, and this, is, this is the world that is being built around us by these big, big, disgusting developers. There are still good, big developers out there. Look at Larian, you know, um, and, and there are others, but that's one of the first ones that pops into my head because of, you know, what we've seen from them recently with Baldur's Gate 3 and stuff. Um, and I mean, you know, I'll give you another one. Tango. Tango is a subsidiary of Xbox and Microsoft, but dude, they, they shadow dropped Hi-Fi Rush on us last year, which is a banger of a game at a $30 price tag. Um, phenomenal. You know, there's still good AAA studios out there doing stuff, but there's a lot of them that, that do us dirty too. And so, um, it's nice to see a big studio saying something like this as well, because it really was unnecessary. And, now, you know, we've got other studios out there like Capcom, who keeps doing more and more gross stuff, like putting microtransactions in a game like Dragon's Dogma 2 that didn't need it, and has been pushing out statements from their CEO saying things like, you know, we need the AAA price tag to go even higher than $70. Right? Where, I mean, how ultra uber disgusting is it to hear that? It just, it's, it's really, really gross. Um, well, no, Davey, absolutely not. Yeah, absolutely not. But it's, it's still nice to hear it from a big studio standpoint where the, like I just said, there are so many other big studios saying the opposite. We just went up over the past year from 60 to 70, and then you've got studios like Capcom saying we need to go from 70 to 80 whenever they're still g just slaughtering games with microtransactions that shouldn't even have them in there, right? So no, I mean, this is, it, obviously it doesn't mean that this is going to happen, but it's a good thing to see other studios getting behind the notion that this isn't the way. Microsoft and Phil Spencer has said the same thing. He's like, 
it's getting kind of gross, you know? So for us as gamers and gaming enthusiasts, I think it's good that we have at least some of these studios standing up and saying, hey, uh, this isn't the way, you know? This is not the way to treat fans. It's not the way to treat consumers. Um, there's a balance, don't get me wrong. And we talk a lot about the fact of how much are you getting out of what you're paying for a game? Everybody's going to feel different about that, right? But I've talked a lot about that recently with the fact that Ninja Theory is coming out with Sanua Saga. That's only going to be an eight-hour game, right? Well, obviously, I'm talking in U.S. dollars, and everybody's going to have to you know, convert that to their own region and stuff like that. Everybody's country has a, a different you know, conversion of currency. And so, I mean, Australia is the same way, Davey. You know, Australia, New Zealand, you know, the, the inflation over, um, well, it's okay. So we can get, we can get into that rabbit hole. <laughs> we can get into that rabbit hole of you're lucky to pay. You know what I mean? There, there are different benefits that different countries get from uh, like, why, why do you pay that much for things? Right. So I'm not going to get into that rabbit hole. Um, so it, yeah, we, we pay less for things like that here, but we also don't have some of the social benefits that you guys get, you know what I mean, um, from having to pay more for, for some of your, you know, your produce, your, 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 your economy, you know, things like that. The, the reason that some of your stuff's more expensive is you have better social um, constructs for taking care of people and things like that than we do in this country, right? We can get into that whole rabbit hole, but I'm not going to. This, it's all about video gaming news. So, um, on a very base level, yeah. But there's a reason why that that it's more expensive in Canada than the uh, same thing for, you know, other countries. Like I said, you know, like Australia, New Zealand, stuff like that. So, um, but it's still, like I said, it's good to hear some studios that have a voice in the industry of being big um stand up for the fact that you know games don't necessarily need to be this price you know they we keep hearing the well it takes more it, it costs more it takes more resources to make uh, you know triple a games i don't doubt that at all right but there's a difference between making good triple a games and bad triple a games too and uh we've seen that happen a lot as well so um I don't know. Um, let's dive into this and see what they say. So the former interim Embracer CEO believes developers will move to reduce risk and costs. Um, Sabres Interactive CEO Matthew Karsh believes the $70 game will eventually become a thing of the past as developers move to reduce costs and risk in an increasingly challenging AAA games market. Speaking to IGN, former interim CEO of Embracer, Karsh discussed Sabres' divestment from the troubled group and where he sees Sabre's place in the market as a standalone publisher. The exec said he believes Sabre, which encompasses studios like Nimble Giant, um, 3D Realms, and potentially 4A Games, occupies the position between independent studios and AAA publishers. Karsh cited Helldivers 2 as an example of the type of middle market game it would like to emulate. He told IGN that one of its upcoming titles, Space Marine 2, will retail for 70 but only because he's concerned audiences would see a cheaper price as emblematic of poor quality. Um, I think that as games become more expensive to make, $70 title is going to go the way of the dodo bird. I do, he said. I just don't think it's sustainable. Look, you remember the hype for Cyberpunk, which I think actually ultimately performed okay. But when the ex expectations are so high and so much money is put into one title, it's hugely risky for the company that's doing it. What if it fails? You remember what happened when Ubi a couple of years ago, all of their titles slipped out of the year, and then all of a sudden, they're in an entirely different place. It's hard to recover from that. I think the market is going to shift to development, which is not necessarily lower quality. There's going to be an emphasis on trying to find ways to reduce costs. I think this is important. I've been talking about this for a while. I don't, th I, I think that, you know, it's, 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 there's some of this, but it's also about getting companies, these development companies back into, uh, a notion of of good content, right? Yeah, it feels like so many of these big studios that have done this are are like 
just riddled with business minded people. I've talked about this before, right? Yeah, like it's not that there aren't good gaming minded people in these companies, but they are just swallowed and overrun with business minded people that don't know anything about what it means to push out good gaming content to us as consumers and gaming enthusiasts anymore. So what do they do is they try to push out the scummiest version of something mediocre anymore that they feel like will just be able to ring our wallets, you know, and it, it feels like it's been happening for a long time, but it, it, at some point that levy is going to break. It's got to, you know, where people start seeing through the bull crap, you know, whether it's these companies that push out quantity over quality, right, with things like modern warfare or, you know, the, the Assassin's Creed stuff. Yeah, um, and it's not that all those games have been terrible, but... I mean, I don't think anybody's going to argue with the fact that those games could be much better if they spent a couple to a few more years on the individual titles instead of pushing them out like candy. You know what I mean? Um, or these titles that come out that have been spent years on, but all they really did was focus on getting some kind of decent core mechanics in that really is nothing special and they are built on a premise of a universe that people love like WB does all the time with something like Suicide Squad and it's riddled with monetization you know they knew that game wasn't going to be good otherwise they wouldn't have put it out at a $70 price tag they would have been more worried about building a, a, a sustainable player base they would have been more worried you know they would have given out you know review copies of that game to review sites but they didn't want to do they knew that game wasn't very good they knew that you know, um, well, yeah, and Davey, you're absolutely right. And that's one of the reasons the monetization of Dragon's Dogma 2 feels so terribly bad. You know what I mean? So th that's what I was talking about originally when the game came out. It was like, dude, they were going to make a ton of money off this game anyways. So uh, even at a seven, you know, they, it's already, it's a $70 game for Capcom, there were so many people that were going to be buying that game, there was no need for the monetization in it. That's why there will always be this, like, kind of black cloud hanging over this game. The content's phenomenal. You know, it needs a little bit of love on performance. It's good enough. The content is good enough to have people overlook the performance issues, but the microtransactions were unnecessary. And it's really just disgusting to see it, right? At, at, even at a $60 price tag, it would have been hugely lucrative for them. Absolutely. No doubt about it. You know? You're absolutely right, buddy. Soup, what's up, buddy? <laughs> Soup's in here inciting violence already, dude. Um, but I think this is, you know, this is part of it, as well as the fact that these, these studios, these developers, these publishers have they're just there's too much business not enough gamers not enough gaming minded people and it doesn't mean that business should go out the window that's not what i'm saying these are businesses they have to be business minded but this is an industry where you're going to lose fans you're going to lose consumers eventually if you don't maintain some kind of moderate mindset at producing quality content for your consumers and your fan base. They're, that's just the way it works. People start seeing through your bull crap, you know? And it, it, it's, uh, I think you're starting to see even bigger studios that are still shining. Like I said, like with Larian. They're big, dude. They're like a 500 plus employee studio, developer studio. Uh, they're independent and they take care of business, dude. They've got great customer support you know it's not like everybody loves everything they do but most people love most of what they do and it, that's a stark contrast from the things you see with like companies like what ea's turned into what blizzards turned into you know what ubi's turned into all of the that stuff you know what i mean um and i think it's it's easier to see a company like Larian being able to sustain that that mindset for the long haul, as opposed to what we've seen happen with those companies I just named and how they, they turned into these just juggernauts of greed. 
You know what I mean? We all know why they got to where they're at. They were phenomenal developers at one point. We all fell in love it, it, with some of these studios that that have lost their way in some form or fashion throughout the years because at one point in their their early years they were amazingly good you know but they lost it they lost it they became consumed with greed with thousands of job cuts announced across the games industry in the past 18 months karch acknowledged that triple a development is going through a major shift and claimed that Past trends of sky-high budgets and lengthy development periods aren't sustainable. I think that there's going to be a real shortage of game content over the coming few years, he said. You've seen how many layoffs there have been. You've seen how many games have gotten killed. But we have a lot of good projects going on that I'm proud of, and I feel really, really strongly about. I'm so glad that Saber got out from underneath Embracer. I do the I I cannot even whenever we first heard Embracer. Or, or uh, you know, Saber was being sold to private investors out from underneath Embracer. I was like, dude, Saber's got to be wiping their brow. You know, it's got to be an incredibly like, br like just a huge breath of fresh air for Saber to be like out from underneath Embracer. I think Gearbox has to feel the same way. Now they're under Take Two, <laughs> which doesn't mean they're like free and clear, but much better than being underneath em Embracer anymore. You know, Gearbox because they got sold to Take Two as well. If you didn't know that. Um, but for all those studios that had been under Embracer for the past couple of years, just feels like they were all just sitting there, just holding their breath going, Oh Jesus, not me next, man. Not me next, you know? So, uh, it's good to hear this. I think that we need more of these, uh, companies and executives having this kind of notion that it's like, you know, more money does not mean better games. It just doesn't. Now, there's something to be said for a good, high-quality production game, but it, the content's got to be there. If the content's there, then all you're doing is making a high-budget trash game, you know? <laughs> and I, there are some companies that, that you know, are, are still big AAA companies that do high-budget content very well, and then there are some that, that do uh, high-budget content very poorly anymore on the constant. And um, it, it's it's... You know, I think a lot of people are starting to see through a lot of this stuff. Apple, good? How dare you? <laughs> oh, man. Don't get me started. Don't get me started. Activision says it banned 27,000 Call of Duty accounts last week. I mean, this is really just a drop in the bucket for how many accounts play that, that game, right? Call of Dookie. That's what Soup likes to call it. Um, but 27,000 accounts got banned. Let's see what we got here. Activision has said that it banned over 27,000 Call of Duty accounts during a free multiplayer weekend for Modern Warfare 3. Uh, Team Ricochet <clears throat> identified and banned over 27,000 accounts over the weekend through a series of upgraded detection systems. The statement reads via Charlie Intel on Twitter. The team is progressing on a new set of security updates and anticipates more ban waves to come. As far as when those additional ban waves will be coming, that's currently unknown. However, it could be assumed that more bans, bans, I think bans, will be coming this week and beyond. Um, alongside the free multiplayer from April 4th through 8, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3 and Warzone saw the beginning of Season 3 for this year's release. With Season 3 came several new maps, game modes, weapons, and more for the latest game from Activision. Um, here's the thing, as we were talking about before, right? Like with, with cheaters and hackers and, and, and people needing to get banned out of games. I do think that Activision has been, um, trying to find better ways to prevent dupe accounts and stuff. But here's, here's the problem with this is, this is great. This is great, right? They're, they're really trying to get rid of these these cheaters and everything, and that's fantastic. But if you don't have a way to prevent people from making dupe accounts and just coming right back in and cheating again, this is just really all for naught, right? So, uh, I mean, it, it does a little bit, but you've got to find ways to not only get rid of these accounts but prevent these players from being in the game as a whole ever again that's where the real 
meat happens. You know, this is where this is where uh, you really start to see uh, the um, the effects take place of of getting the the game into a, a positive state, the community being into a a uh, uh, a better place, ridding itself of cheaters and and hackers and malicious actors and stuff like that. When you're able to remove the accounts and prevent the, the those those actors from coming back into the community right how well they're doing it that i don't know but it's a good start how many are they preventing from coming back in that's what we need to know forza motorsport update 7 notably shrinks the game's file size adds brands hatch track um this game is not very good it's had a lot of issues on release. Um, this is the most recent Forza game, right? Um, it came out in October of last year, and it's got a 40% positive of over... Uh, coming up on 6,000 user ratings. It's uh, it struggled. It struggled. And it's a weird look for a game that has had so many iterations at this point. And has had the same developers behind it for quite some time to come out with a game now that is just seemingly getting worse. You know, it's like they don't even, uh, you know, I talk about this from time to time. When you're talking about um, continual iterations of games coming out and if something's not broken, don't fix it, you know, meaning that if a game has done fairly well previously, then stick to what was good about it. Stick to what the, the community liked about the game. Don't change much of that. You know, obviously games need to be modernized a little bit, correct? I mean, that's the way gaming works. Uh, the evolution of technology and gaming, you, you need to take a, a pretty good look at how you can modernize a game. But if, if you've got something that's been pretty good in the past that people have enjoyed, why would you change that? take a look at from like something like payday 2 with star breeze payday 2 was a phenomenal game people loved that game and then they came out with payday 3 and they totally crushed i mean like the player base nobody really liked payday 3 it was pretty terrible and it was because they changed so many things they didn't need to change payday 2 was phenomenal all they needed to do was make the game more modern keep a lot of those core mechanics Make the game more, and it feels like this is another one of those iterations. You know, Forza Motorsport's been around for a long time, and um, it, it hasn't always been a game that has been rated this bad. That's for sure. Otherwise, it wouldn't have another iteration right now. You know, but I think it's an important thing for for developers to understand that you, if you've been doing something well, you stick to those core mechanics. Things evolve for sure. You've got to take a look at the way things evolve in gaming because technology evolves, gaming evolves and stuff. But uh, a lot of things that, that have been well done well for you and have been good for you, you stick to that. And uh, from what I understand, that's been an issue for this series, uh, especially with this new iteration. But uh, let's get back into this. Forza's got an update that shrinks the game's file size and adds a uh, brand's hatch track. So... The file size of the game is getting reduced by around 25 gigs on Series X and 29 gigs on PC. Uh, offering some new content as well. Let's watch this real quick. Hey everyone. Today we're excited to walk you through the latest update for Forza Motorsport. Update 7 will be live in the game for 5 weeks before Update 8 is released in mid-May. This update introduces a new free track to career, multiplayer, free play, and rivals. Brands Hatch is widely considered one of the most iconic sporting venues in Europe and is renowned for its challenging layout with a combination of fast straights, tight corners, and elevation changes that make it a favorite among drivers and fans alike. The Grand Prix layout features three high-speed corners called I mean, The game looks horns, dope, doesn't it? Westfield, and Sheen Curve, which challenged drivers to be millimeter accurate when choosing their turn-in points on this relatively narrow circuit. Meanwhile, the Indy layout is a short 1.2-mile thrill ride, which pairs perfectly with slower cars and grassroots events. Step behind the wheel of iconic race cars and immerse yourself in bygone eras of motorsport in the Retro Racers Tour. 
experienced cars that started on the road and emerged into track machines such as the 1981 Ford No. 2 Zack Speed Racing Capri Turbo in Rulebook Racers. Reminisce the golden era of sports car innovation in Unlimited Racers featuring the 1969 Lola No. 10 Simonized Special T163. Master the fastest, most dangerous cars of the 1960s, including the 1967 Brabham BT24 in Grand Prix Racers. Dive into iconic prototype racers such as the 1988 Jaguar No. 1 Jaguar Racing XJR-9, whose speed and beauty were only limited by the amount of fuel they burned. It's like driving a box, racers. dude. <laughs> Complete all four series. Yeah, sounds good, Aero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Appreciate you, buddy. I'll take a look at that video here in a little bit, okay, man? Keep Renault Thanks, dude. Elf RS01 and take on the most famous Grand Prix race cars of the 1970s in the reward show. Eight row with the luscious locks, As dude. this update will be Eight available got for five weeks, hair. there's a fifth spotlight car, the 1975 <laughs> BMW number 25 BMW Motorsport If I could have that hair and just not have CSL. to maintain it, you know. <laughs> this car does not have a corresponding career series. I would. However, it will have a spotlight event in multiplayer and rivals. The open class tour celebrates the 1960s as Drivatar opponents race behind the wheel extra of food iconic for me, man. cars that build up through E, D, C, and B classes. Complete all four really open does. class What's tour up, series to unlock yeah, the 1964 Brabham BT8 <laughs> and lead it towards yet What's another up, victory at Brands Hatch in the reward showcase. In the featured multiplayer spec series, Week 1 invites you to relive history in lightweight Formula 60s open wheel cars that changed Formula racing forever. I'll grow mine for like Week a year. Two shifts like, gears into the new and competitive BMW M <laughs> Eight Pro rows is super series. long. Week three really highlights the too. GTP Group C cars. Once Pinky's got really long hair too. His design. his hair looks nice also. Week four. I don't know. I, dude, I just, it, it gets too much for me. Are brutal man. with vintage Le Mans sports cars. I don't like. I don't Finally, like maintaining week it. Week five experience <laughs> an escalating horsepower contest between teams in the 1970s golden era of Formula racing. This month's featured rivals event will see the community compete for the leaderboard position at Brands Hatch. I think GP even if I was a lady, I'd have I'd have hair like pink does, you know. Lola, number six, <laughs> Sonico T70 yeah, dude, yeah. Mark III B. And remember, Spotlight Rivals presents a new opportunity for you to challenge your skills each week. Now, players with VIP membership can experience one of the fastest racing cars ever made, the Group C prototype 1987 Porsche 962C at Hockenheim Full Circuit in the Sunset Showdown VIP Rivals. Now, VIPs also receive a 15% discount on this classic car, so if you don't already have it, this is your chance to go and get it. Three new deliveries are coming to CarPass holders. These include the 2019 Janetta G55 GT4, the 1970 Matra Simca number 146, a Keep Matra Simca MS650 Tour de France, and the 2016 Ligier number 11 Euro International JSP3. Oh, for real? Once these cars are released, yeah, the car there's a lot less work, complete. right? Yeah. The latest update introduces some changes to Forza race regulations alongside numerous game fixes. Go to Forza.net today to learn more about everything coming to Forza Motorsport with updates. New content, seven. game stay fixes. Stay tuned for the full release notes on Forza support. Thank you for playing Forza Motorsport, and we'll Hit see you at the track. Okay. So there you go, man. I mean, if, if you're into the, uh, the Forza stuff, I don't think there's anything more to read on this, really. Um, I will link it for you just in case. I think that they have a long way to go to get people back into, um, you know, enjoying what, what this series has always been. It, it feels like a lot of fans of, of the series have not really enjoyed what the new Forza entry has given, has brought to the... Uh, <sighs> brought to them as far as content's concerned and, and uh that's unfortunate so um i don't know hopefully hopefully it gets better sure. um this is we've touched on this already so uh i'm not going to go through this entire article but what i will tell people is that there is a big movement right now uh that's gaining a lot of traction in the uh gaming community okay and it's all about uh quest for political action to preserve old video games right and I, I think that everybody needs to be aware of that this is happening. I'm going to link this. I've talked about it in previous video gaming uh, news segments. Uh, what this really comes down to is uh, there's a video here for people to watch. Highly recommend watching this. The, uh, the, the, 
the premise of what this is coming down to is the stop killing games end goal is that governments will implement legislation to ensure the following. There's more than just this, but these are the key points. Games sold must be left in a functional state. Games sold must also require no further connection to the publisher or affiliated parties to function. Uh, the above also applies to games that have sold microtransactions to customers, and the above cannot be superseded by end-user license agreements. There's a lot of uh, additional stuff that comes into play here, but you know, as we continue to move into a digital realm of gaming, this becomes more and more applicable and more and more important and appropriate for us as consumers. And I think that people need to be hyper aware of what this is and what this means and to understand there's also... Um, a, a stop killing games website and campaign access this get spun up on what this means for all of us as gaming um enthusiasts and um you know see if there's anything you can do to to jump on board and, and kind of back this movement because this is good for all of us obviously in pc gaming we've been in a digital realm of gaming for a long time now these movements are starting to take place because console is is starting to turn over into that space as well and so it's like well almost everything's going to be digital before long right and so while this probably should have happened a long time ago um at least it's finally happening there's more people getting on the front and th this notion that preserving video game history is important making sure that the games we pay for and we invest in well whether it be you know, buying the games outright, the microtransactions we pay for, any of that stuff is not lost because the, the developers of the games go, well, we're just going to shut it down. You're not going to be able to access it anymore. Things of that nature. You know what I mean? So this is very important. I highly recommend people take a look at this. There's, uh, again, a video to watch. There's a link for, uh, I'll just pull this up and give you the link to the website as well. I need to bookmark that anyways. And um, this is the Stop Killing Games website. Highly, highly important. Take a look at all this stuff, guys. Um, now, the last thing we have to talk about this morning is that uh, gamers need to circle tomorrow. We've had this, I've had this bookmarked for quite some time now. But tomorrow is going to be the, um, what is it? The Triple uh, I? Triple I? Yeah, Triple I Initiative Showcase. So it's all about indie studios uh, revealing um, new titles and gameplay, demos and stuff like that. For games that they, they have coming out, right? Uh, the event aims to focus on AAA games with indie studios featuring AA or AAA production values um, like A44's Flintlock, The Siege of Dawn. Expect appearances from studios like Focus Entertainment and Gearbox as well. So, um, Evil Empire, the studio responsible for the 2018 hit indie title Dead Cells, has revealed the Triple A Initiative Showcase, which is going to happen tomorrow, right? And this takes place at what? I think uh, 10 a.m. Pacific. That means noon o'clock for us. Noon o'clock. Um, so my thought is, so tomorrow is obviously a day off, right? Um, as Wednesdays are always a day off for us here in this community. But um, I'm going to try my best. I'm planning on going live for this, okay? It's uh, only supposed to be about 45 minutes long. So what I'm thinking about doing is going live for probably around an hour. I'll probably go live right before this starts, probably about 10 minutes before this starts or something. We'll uh, kind of watch this and then just sum up the stream. So we'll try and just see everything that gets announced here, okay? So um, I am going to try and do my very best to be live midday tomorrow that way around my lunchtime uh, it would be normally about six hours into our stream so normally i start at 6 a.m cst cdt this is taking place at 12 o'clock p.m cst cdt so uh whatever your time zone is if you know whenever i normally start streaming think about <coughs> six five and a half to six hours after I would normally be live, that's when I will be going live tomorrow, okay? <clears throat> so, Wednesdays are a big day. I've got multiple appointments tomorrow, but I have a little bit of time in uh, during lunch time tomorrow where uh, I'm going to go ahead and make sure that I can be live for this so that we can watch this together. So, if you want to be a part of it, just know, even though I'm normally not live on Wednesdays, I will be live for a small amount of time tomorrow so that we can experience this together, okay? Live on a Wednesday. I know, baby, right? Yeah, let's go. Heck yeah. I'm doing my best. You know what I mean? So, uh, it's uh, tomorrow. 
uh, 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific, or that is 12 o'clock my time, CST, CDT. Um, it, it will be available on YouTube, Twitch, IGN, and Steam. We'll watch it here together. I'll probably watch it through their Twitch stream uh, or YouTube. 45 minutes long. Be prepared for that. So it'll probably go until um, roughly, you know, right before 1 o'clock p.m. my time, which would be 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern or 11 o'clock a.m. Pacific time. And uh, we'll get to see a lot of stuff from some indie studios. So I'm really excited for that. You can see all the entire list of studios that are supposed to be showcasing stuff. Uh, yeah. So I'll link this for you guys and just know that we will be hanging out for a small amount of time tomorrow. You know what I mean? There you go. There you go. If you want to see all the studios, they're going to be part of it. Cool. That's the news. Um, PSA. Uh, I had something. Um, so so my daughter has a uh, an appointment today. Uh, I thought my wife was going to be able to handle it, but she uh, ended up having something come up at work. She's got to work late. So I will probably have to call it unless my wife surprises me and does get off on time. Um so I'll probably have to call the stream today around the same time I did yesterday. So we'll probably only get about a six, six and a half hour stream in today. I do apologize. Um, it's just one of those things where uh, family comes first. It's uh, being able to stream gives me the flexibility to be able to be here and provide uh, support for the family in um, being agile and flexible for what the family needs from me. You know, so most of the time, you know, I do my best to stream eight, nine hours a day. But sometimes things like this happen. And um, my daughter has has something that I need to get her to today. Uh, be play play that dad role you know what i mean so um we will have a great rest of the day playing dragon's dogma 2 but it's quite possibly i'm gonna have to call it around uh 12 30 today my time but that means we're gonna have you know a little over four hours of game time left if uh i, if I do have to call it early okay so just be prepared for that also don't forget like we just talked about we're gonna be doing uh, a little bit of live streaming tomorrow around lunchtime just to uh check out this triple i initiative showcase cool um, also starting on Saturday, the stream will not be live for roughly a week. I'm, I'm having a vacation with my family. It's the first time we've done that in quite some time. And, um, as much as I'm going to miss the crap out of you guys, it's uh, going to be nice to, uh, have a bit of a vacation with the family. Uh, we haven't gotten to have a vacation together in a long time and I'm, I'm looking forward to it, but I will miss the crap out of you and um just know that okay so it's in the titles i've i've got it got it in the titles and everything it's been on our schedule for quite some time and it is quickly approaching so starting um so we'll have a small stream tomorrow for the triple i showcase i will stream full streams thursday and friday and then starting saturday i will be down for roughly the next week as soon as i get back we'll start playing no rest for the wicked along with more dragon's dogma 2 as we try to move forward with uh, summing up the main game uh, for Dragon's Dogma 2, okay? Um, but I'm not trying to rush Dragon's Dogma 2 either, okay? So just know that. Awesome video gaming news segment. Thank you guys very much. We are going to go play Day 15 of Dragon's Dogma 2 right now. We've got a lot of cool stuff happening in the game. And uh, I appreciate you guys being a part of it. Everybody that uh, contributes on the constant to what we talk about here, what we dive into in these articles, providing different you know, viewpoints of, of what these, uh, topics bring to the table for us is trying to, uh, maintain, you know, a, a nice up to date, you know, <laughs> comprehensive knowledge of what's going on in the video gaming industry. I appreciate it very much. People are always giving me, um, awesome, uh, topics that I might not have had otherwise uh, to, to remain relevant with what's happening in the industry. And, and you guys are, are amazing. I appreciate it very much. Uh, so as we normally do, we're going to move into playing some some uh, video gaming playthrough content coming up in just a moment with Dragon's Dogma 2 continuing our playthrough. But if anybody's hanging out and you're not familiar with what the community is about <clears throat> and what we do around here, as I've stated previously, uh, we, we have every Wednesday off, so tomorrow will be mostly a day off. I will be live for just a moment. It's a, it's a little bit of a weird situation, but um, normally uh, Wednesdays are off. We stream uh, the other six days of the week, starting at 6 a.m. CST CDT. That's 7 a.m. Eastern or 4 a.m. Pacific time. We begin with video gaming news, just always staying current with what's happening in the industry trying to promote a healthier industry for ourselves as consumers and video gaming enthusiasts. 
And uh, then we move on and play games for the rest of the day. <clears throat> we have a great time. It's always a lot of fun, a lot of laughs. And uh, it's about you know having a legitimate community here that is always taking care of one another, lifting each other up when we need it, and um, just enjoying the world of video games together, being void of negativity, toxicity, being civil about any kind of differences we might have. It's okay to be different. We're humans. That's natural. But uh, you know, being civil about that is important. I think a lot of civility has been lost on people nowadays. And um, being civil is important about stuff. Um, as well as just, you know, spreading good vibes. That's what it's all about. So if you can dig that, come be a part of what we do. We're always looking for more awesome people, good peoples to be a part of what this community is um, already. And so if you can dig that, come be a part of what we do when we're live. Other than that, stay healthy, stay safe, be kind. Happy Tuesday. Hope uh, everybody's week has been going well so far. And... Um, I don't know. Don't forget, I will be live for just a, a little bit tomorrow while we watch the uh, AAA Initiative Showcase. But until then, you know, uh, big love. And I'm going to run us an outro real quick to uh, some of the video gaming news segment. But as uh, I'm not going anywhere, the stream's not going down. As soon as it's over, I'll be back and we will start getting prepared for playing more Dragon's Dogma 2. All right? You guys rock. I'll be right back. <laughs>